Welcome everybody. Welcome here to our session today on exploring the future of Iran-EU relations. My name is Svante Schenner and I'm head of the Middle East Department of Heinrich Böll Foundation's um, head office in Berlin. And I'm very happy to have been invited by our Brussels office. I have a few technical remarks uh, that I would like to do. Um, one of them is that um, there is a recording in progress, so please be aware of that. So a second one is that, of course, we expect your um, lively performance and participation, and for that we have established the Q&A tool. So whatever you have as questions or remarks, please feel free to put them there. And I'd also like to highlight that at the end of the session, there will be a survey. So once the session closes, there will be a pop-up window and please uh, push the button continue to proceed with that. We are very happy to talk on the issue of the relations between Iran and the EU in such, a, uh, such an important moment in time. And we have the some um, questions prepared. We will walk you through basically domestic issues as well as geopolitical ones. But before we get deeper into that matter, I'd like to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Roderick, Director of the Brussels Office of Heinrich Böll Foundation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bente, and uh, good morning uh, to all of you joining us from the United States. And good afternoon to those from Brussels, Berlin, Paris, or elsewhere. Uh, in Europe. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name is Roger Kefferputz. I'm the director of the EU office here in Brussels, the German Green Political Foundation. We foster dialogue on democracy, the green transformation, and of course, on critical foreign policy issues. And today, on the need for a new Iran strategy for the EU. And I'm really, really pleased and delighted to have such an esteemed panel of experts with us to discuss this today, experts from both sides of the Atlantic. So we'll get to hear also the US perspective and of course the European perspective. And I think uh, this webinar is also coming at a very, very uh, propitious moment, let's say, because a lot of things are in flux. Uh, just uh, this week, uh, the European Council has widened its sanctions uh, on Iran. Uh, moving not just sanctioning drones, but also moving it towards missiles and missile technology. We've also published an article by one of our speakers, Cornelius Arba, uh, on uh, the EU's strategy towards Iran and its sanctions policy. You will find that article on our website as well. And I think that relations are in a downward spiral and the situation with Iran is deteriorating. There's a lot of issues to discuss ranging from uh, the human rights situation uh, in Iran, where we have the latest examples of death penalties against anti-corruption activist Mahmoud Merhab and against rapper Tumaj Salehi. We could talk about the nuclear program, Iran-Israel, Russia-Iran relations, a lot of complicated issues and I think to be able to look at it in a comprehensive manner, uh, that's why we have two experts from both sides of the Atlantic with us today. I'm really happy that we managed to get this going and uh, without further ado, I'll pass the floor back uh, to Bente to walk us through it. Bente, thank you so much for moderating today's event. Thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure because of course we look at Iran and we are uh, aware of the different issues that you already mentioned. I mean, a lot of concerns and contentious issues are there to discuss. The domestic situation, the human rights violations, the repression of the revolution that started in Iran. You mentioned some uh, really dark moments with death, death penalties against activists and artists. There is, of course, the nuclear issue that remains unsolved and that is, great, uh, is of great concern. Then, of course, uh, the permanent the regional role that Iran is playing, especially when looking at the support of militias like Hezbollah or the Houthis. Most recently, we saw a wave of attacks by drones and rockets launched at Israel coming from Iran and a moment in which escalation, further escalation was absolutely impossible. And it also you touched upon the Iranian-Russian cooperation on issues that are of concern for the EU, especially also when looking at Ukraine. So 
It's a broad portfolio, but I'd love to start with a domestic situation. And for that, I'm happy to introduce to you Yugi Sonia. Um, it's very early for you, Giso. You're joining from across the Atlantic. You're based in LA. So it's really early in the morning. Thank you very much for uh, coming here to talk to us. Um, let me introduce you because Gisonia recently has been um, elected amongst the 500 most influential people in the Washington bubble, so to say. Gisonia is the founder and director of the Strategic Litigation Project at the Atlantic Council. And that is a project that works on prevention and accountability efforts for atrocity crimes, human rights violations, terrorism, corruption offenses around the world. And um, um, Gisu is a human rights lawyer by formation and a non-profit leader. She serves as board chair of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, where she helps oversee the group's human rights advocacy and legal programs, which seek to promote accountability, respect for human rights and the rule of law in Iran. She previously served as executive director for the group. She started her career actually in The Hague, where she worked on war crimes and crimes against humanity trials at the International Criminal Tribu Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Court. She lectures and she publishes widely on global human rights developments, as well as the rule of law and post-conflict and transitional societies. And so we really have a an excellent expert to talk on a lot of issues that are related to accountability and first of all also on the crimes committed. So Gisu, on the for the domestic situation in Iran, what are the international avenues? Oh, wait a second, we wanted to start with a poll actually, because we'd like to know what do you actually know about or think about the subject of today's um, topic? And therefore, we established a little poll. So for the audience, before we come to Yugi, so we have the question, is the EU doing enough to address the multiple challenges that Iran poses? You have two ways to answer, yes or no. So please let us know what you think. I'm really curious to see what comes out of that. Unfortunately, we on the panel can't vote, uh, but uh, we will share our insights into that anyway with you. So to all the participants, did you make use of your possibility to vote and let us know what you think? Is the EU doing enough? I don't know for how long you'll be keeping the poll open. And actually, I don't see the results, Paul. Could you help me out on that? Oh, here we go. Wow, okay, that gives us quite a clear picture. The no is overwhelming. So that's a good uh, starting point. I mean, there is always uh, room to do more, but it's not easy to know what to do more. So Giso, can you please start? A uh, very warm welcome again. Let us know about the domestic situation. What are international avenues to hold the Iranian regime accountable for its human rights violations, such as internet shutdowns, the ex excessive use of force, arbitrary arrests, and sexual and gender-based violence, for example? I mean, there are plenty of more. You can tell us also more. But let us know, what are your insights into how can we as EU address this? <clears throat> um, Bente and uh, uh, Roderick, thank you so much for having me. And apologies, it is a, a little bit early here in LA, even though I was on this Washingtonian 500 list, I'm actually based on the other coast. Um, so in terms of what needs to be done, I mean, I think in the opening, we see here that there's a range of security focused issues, um, terrorism focused issues, a, a lot in terms of the Islamic Republic's cross-border activities, and not only what they're doing regionally, but of course in Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, but I think that the focus really should continue to be on the domestic movement for human rights and dignity and more freedom. And the reason I say that is because 
you know, anybody who's been in the Iran space for a long time, either as an analyst or working on the human rights file and doing documentation for groups, will know that traditionally the policy has always been very security focused. Around the time of the JCPOA, there was a lot of emphasis on how governments need to best work with the Islamic Republic to either work on paths of reform or putting reform aside, internal reforms and domestic reforms aside, just how to contain um, the security situation. I think what we saw with the protests that began in September 2022 and continued after the death of Masajina Amini is that there is a serious human rights situation to deal with in the country that is really boiling over. So this is something that obviously folks who've been focused on the human rights file have been saying for a long time. But it was never, the focus really was never on that in terms of policy. I think we saw a very welcome shift um, where policymakers started to finally see that it would be imperative to center dissidents, to look at what are the approaches that will help um, really uh, bring change internally in terms of what young people, but not only young people, but people from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds um, were really calling for. And I think there's a very clear opportunity that presents itself at the moment for European countries. And I'll get a little bit specific, but I think it's something that I'd really like the audience to know just in case they're not aware of this and how this could really help for accountability. So obviously the massive issue is that um, courts in Iran are unwilling or unable to deliver justice for the victims and survivors of what we saw happen in September 2022 and on. So for anybody who's not familiar, there was a massive violent crackdown, largely on peaceful protests that included um, shooting protesters with live ammunition, blinding them. So there was a targeted pattern of blinding, um, a lot of very uh, brute force, and also folks who were taken into detention were subjected to custodial torture. Um, and the list goes on. There's enforced disappearances, intimidation of family members, um, a very long list of abuses. The UN fact-finding mission on Iran, which was set up by a special session of the UN Human Rights Council in November 2022 at the height of, the, of what is referred to as the Women Life Freedom Protest, they recently issued a report in March, a 20-page mandated report at that session of the Human Rights Council, but also a 500-plus page conference room paper that went into detail in their findings, and they concluded that the Islamic Republic committed crimes against humanity during the protests that began in September 2022 and following. And the reason that's significant is because a lot of UN fact-finding missions often have more of a human rights focus. Finding crimes against humanity is an international criminal law finding, and that is significant because that can give rise to criminal prosecutions, not only in international courts, for which it can be a bit complicated with Iran because it often falls out of jurisdiction of those courts, but also in national courts that have the ability to investigate and prosecute alleged perpetrators under international law. And of course, we're speaking here today um, with Heinrich Boll, and, and Germany is actually one of the leaders when it comes to what we call universal jurisdiction and the application of that. We've seen that, of course, with regularity when it comes to crimes committed in the Syrian conflict, but it should be noted that there are alleged Islamic Republic of Iran officials who you know, have allegedly uh, committed atrocity crimes, who have traveled to Germany in years past, and not a single arrest warrant has been issued for any of those individuals. So I would say that what I would like to see countries in Europe that have universal a universal jurisdiction framework, that is, they have the ability to prosecute individuals whose nationality is from another country, where the victims are from another country, and where the 
act was actually committed in another country, very similar to this the Syrian conflict, as I mentioned. I'd like to see the exercise of that on Iran. Um, there's also the ability to open structural investigations. There's currently a pending request to German authorities to open a structural investigation into crimes against humanity committed by the Islamic Republic in during the woman life freedom protests. Structural investigations are where you do not need an identified perpetrator. You do not need the presence of a perpetrator. You'd be looking into the structures. So you'd be looking at what is the role of the Ministry of Interior? What is the role of the Ministry of Intelligence in committing core international crimes? And you, this gives you the ability to collect evidence from, let's say, Iranian refugees who fled that violence and who are now settled in Germany. Germany has the ability to open structural investigations. Sweden, France, we're also focused on Canada. But these are the target countries that we're looking at and, and really asking for that push. It's not only a question of merits and basis, it's also a question of political will. Um, there are structural investigations open on Syria, on Ukraine, and for ISIS crimes. Now is the time to do this for Iran. And that was actually an explicit recommendation of the UN fact-finding mission on Iran in their conference room paper. They specifically discussed structural investigations and urged countries that are able to do so to do so. And in their 20 page mandated report, they were very clear that while they would like to see accountability in Iran's courts, they are really looking to other UN member states to explore accountability options in international courts and in national courts where again, they have a universal jurisdiction framework and the ability to pursue things under international law. So I know that was a very specific recommendation, but it's something where European countries can take tangible action now. And I think it's not being discussed enough, though we hope to change that in the coming months and make sure that it's very clear that this is an option that is available, open, and that there just needs to be the political will to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, that is really already a long list of interesting and important points. Uh, just allow me to give you my, uh, one question back, because I'm not sure whether everybody is familiar with structural investigations. We obviously saw how much of a role they played in the Syria cases that were treated under universal jurisdiction in Germany. But if you say there is a pending case, what would it take for 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 parties interested in starting structural investigations, who can launch such a structural investigation or ask for it to be opened? So this is a question for uh, the judicial authorities, of course, and prosecutors. So one thing that I should mention um, is that there is something called Eurojust. So some of the participants may be familiar with what that is, but essentially it's um, this network that was constructed to assist in cross-border investigations of complex crimes in Europe. The Eurojust has something called the Genocide Network, which focuses on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, so really atrocity crimes. And initially, that was an annual gathering of different European prosecutors, judges, and investigators from work, uh, who are either working with or working on cases affiliated with war crimes units across the continent. Now that's a global network. So you'll see that um, any prosecutors that are able to prosecute those sorts of crimes will be in attendance so from the US, Canada, Australia, and so on. Um, Unfortunately, universal jurisdiction isn't truly universal yet, though there is a move to strengthen those um, authorities in Asia, in Latin America, and also in Africa. So there is a movement towards that. Um, at Eurojust, the, at the Eurojust Genocide Network this year, uh, my organization, the Strategic Litigation Project at the Atlantic Council, was actually invited as a civil society organization, along with Mnemonic and ECCHR, which is based in Berlin, um, to come and brief the Genocide Network on Iran. 
and on accountability for Iran and specifically an archive, uh, Iranian archive that we've created that preserves digital evidence from open source information concerning the violence that was inflicted on protesters in, in the woman life freedom protests. Um, so basically we're trying to preserve, you know, vulnerable pieces of evidence online that could otherwise be lost. But the reason I mentioned this is because the secretariat of the genocide network was interested and invited us. And this is the first time that civil society organizations are briefing the network on Iran. Um, Iran was on the agenda in the past, but it was Swedish prosecutors briefing about the one and only universal jurisdiction case on Iran that happened in a Swedish courts um, against somebody who, who was part of the 1988 uh, prison massacre. But basically there was an interest from the secretariat. So that was a great sign for us because civil society organizations are not often invited to brief. There's a few permanent members, but this is much more um, a meeting of states and state authorities. So we were excited that we were invited. And then there was obviously discussions with the war crimes units there. And there was a signaling of interest in opening up a joint investigation team, which would be able to coordinate information among states. Um, for example, the one that's built on Ukraine right now includes the US. Um, so it can include a lot of different actors in that. But there's a there's an interest in opening this up. It has to come from the states. I would say that foreign ministries are also involved in this decision because, as I said, it's not purely one that's based on um, access to evidence and you know, uh, really looking at the components of of the crimes, but it's it's also something that requires political will. So I'd say it's a combination of prosecutors wishing to open this, but also some of the political parts of government also giving the green light, essentially. Indeed, interesting that you had the chance to do this presentation and that it was met with interest. So, well, we already have a starting point to really see something of tangible action. Thank you very much, Kisu. I'd now like to move to the more geopolitical challenges. And for that, I'd love to introduce to you our other distinguished speaker today, which is uh, Cornelius Adeba. He has been working as an independent analyst and entrepreneur since 2000, focusing mainly on foreign and security policy, and in particular regarding Iran and the Persian Gulf, on European and transatlantic affairs, and on citizens' engagement. Um, Cornelius is also a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Europe in Brussels, as well as associate fellow at the German Council for Foreign Relations in Germany, and an adjunct fellow um, at adjunct faculty at the Hertie School in Berlin. He has been a member of Team Europe, which is an experts net network of the European Commission, and he has been part of that since 2003. He holds an MA and a PhD in political science from Free University in Berlin. And since 2005, he has been an adjunct professor teaching at various international universities, including the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy in Erfurt, or at Tehran University in Iran, and the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's author of Learning and Change in European Foreign Policy, so very much related also to the topic we have today. And you will also find uh, um, his publication on Europe and around the nuclear deal and beyond. So thank you very much, Cornelius, for taking the time for being with us today. And as I said, uh, I'd love to um, see what you have to say about the geopolitical challenges that uh, Iran poses. And once again, let's ask how should the EU deal with it? How has the EU already responded? And what can you tell us about what has worked of that and what has not? Thank you very much, um, Bente uh, and Roderick, uh, for inviting me for hosting this. In fact, thank you, uh, Gisunia, for sharing the panel. Um, it's my my pleasure and honor um, to to speak here. And um, I was actually uh, very moved by the flattering uh, introduction you presented. Um, except that I'd wish you would leave out the the year dates um, because it makes me feel very old. Um, but that said, um, uh, I want to, to, as you asked me, I want to uh, dive a little bit into the more geopolitical side of things, but with two caveats. Um, and the one is uh, that, of course, it's very you know, sensible um, on such a panel to zoom in and zoom out and you know, take different perspectives. Um, but of course, um, and, and many of you will agree, the two are not so separable. 
Uh, there is not a neat distinction between one and the other. And I'm also saying this because I was uh, just the other day reminded, um, and here I am going back uh, in history once more, and uh, it shall be also be my only remark about Germany. Um, I'm reminded of the Mykonos um, uh, court case uh, of the 1990s, because it was uh, last month, it was 27 years uh, since a German court um, uh, implicated the leadership of the Islamic Republic into uh, a murder that took place in Berlin in a, a Greek restaurant uh, where four uh, Iranian dissidents uh, were murdered. Um, and I'm saying that because uh, already at the time there was talk about Iran coming out of the cold uh, after the Iran-Iraq war. Um, the Europeans were fairly eager uh, to involve Iran, both economically but also politically. The Middle East peace process was uh, a, a major um, policy item at the time, and uh, Iran could be a spoiler, and as we see today, uh, likes to be a spoiler. But there were also efforts by the Europeans to bring in Iran uh, at the table. And if you like, these were kind of these at this global international level. Um, and all these efforts were upended um, when this German court uh, said that uh, it's the leadership of the Islamic Republic, the Supreme Leader, uh, the Minister uh, for the Intelligence Services, uh, which were behind the killing. So it was a state sanctioned killing and, and approved, so to say, by um, a German court. Um, and that gives you a little bit of an idea um, of the, the relationship between the two. And it, it also uh, pours, I fear, uh, some water um, into the wine. Uh, Giso was, was um, mentioned in passing that it just needs political will um, to go for these, for example, for cases like universal jurisdiction. And yes, it does take political will, but that's also a very tall order at, at times. The second um, caveat that I that I would like to make um, is uh, about uh, the, the term geopolitical. It's become a little bit fashionable, fashionable um, as of late, uh, but Iran has always um, taken up a geopolitical position also from the view uh, of the Europeans. It's this famous crossroad um, of civilizations. Um, it's uh, at the center uh, located between uh, Asia and Europe, uh, Africa, uh, and the heart of the Middle East. Um, so many people have seen Iran through this geopolitical lens and come to the conclusion uh, that this is um, a country one should engage with simply because of its centrality. Um, and it's also there is a, a view from Iran, uh, which uh, for a long time held uh, some geopolitical terms, if you can say so, uh, because Iran, uh, since the Islamic Republic, but already before, said that it would want to be neither East nor West. Um, we're going back to the uh, 70s and 80s, obviously there. Um, but this is saying that uh, Iran saw itself or see, continued to see itself until some point um, as a country, as a civilization um, between other uh, blocks. Um, and this is uh, something which which has changed. And here I come to the uh, to the. the today's view of, of the geopolitical significance um, of Iran to an extent, because this has, has clearly changed uh, that Iran uh, no longer wants uh, to have an, an equidistant uh, relationship uh, to whatever you could consider a Western bloc and an Eastern bloc with all the, the fuzziness about these terms. It's not just geography playing a, a role in there. Um, to be truth be told uh, that that Iran um, over the past couple of years has actually said uh, we're no longer interested in the West. Um, we're certainly not interested in Europe. Uh, Europe couldn't deliver on the, the issues uh, that we cared about, that we wanted uh, to work with. Um, most importantly, uh, the nuclear deal of 2015, which was kind of uh, a building block um, also from, from a European perspective of getting Iran back into, into international structures, opening a way uh, not just uh, closing, so to say, the threat emanating from Iran's nuclear program, but also uh, bringing in a perspective of how Iran could could actually uh, be reintegrated uh, as a, you know, a responsible player. I'm saying this with all the the carefulness that that this term deserves these days. But that was part of the idea, and Iran has has ultimately said uh, we are no longer interested um, in having this equidistant relationship. The Europeans can't deliver, as I said. Uh, the Americans have always the same policy towards us, whether it is a Republican president or a Democrat president, it doesn't matter much. Um, th no president can actually give them uh, the kind of guarantee or, or affirmation uh, that uh, treaties or agreements would be upheld. Uh, this is, of course, an allusion uh, to President Trump uh, reneging on uh, the nuclear deal. Um, and last kind of 
bit in this this puzzle uh, is the, that uh, Iran decided to ultimately uh, with Russia so decided to side with Russia. Um, that's what I wanted to say uh, because uh, once the, uh, the the Russia had started its attack on uh, Ukraine. Uh, Iran was instrumental, um, uh, actually, on the battlefield, delivering first drones uh, and now possibly also missiles uh, to Russia um, in its war against uh, Ukraine. And that is something uh, which also has changed the perception of the Europeans uh, to a very high degree. Um, not everyone uh, in, in Brussels has always been interested in Iran and what is going on in Iran. There was uh, a small group of very committed and, and um, convinced people uh, working on the negotiations, uh, the nuclear negotiations. Uh, there is another group uh, looking Looking much more at the human rights situation, um, but Iran, as as a as a case uh, of foreign policy, um, did not concern the the EU in a broader sense so much, um, despite the the prominence that uh, obviously the nu nuclear negotiations had. But this has changed now uh, because of the the importance, uh, obviously, of of the Ukraine war for the European security and uh, the contributions uh, that Iran has has made uh, to Russia's side. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, and I'm, I'm going also back to, to something uh, that, that you mentioned before, there is again a tendency uh, to maybe view Iran only through the security lens, uh, the, the lens of in, in a defensive way, pretty much. Um, what does Iran do that concerns European security? Uh, whereas there are so many other issues um, uh, on the table. Some of them have been mentioned, the domestic situation, the human rights situation, uh, but also regional uh, security, regional concerns. Um, we, we will not probably go deeply into the Israel-Gaza-Palestine conundrum, but of course this is something uh, where, where Iran uh, plays a major role, um, with, and which is also um, of concern to the Europeans. Uh, so in that sense, um, the, the geopolitical view um, that I've been asked to present is just one. Um, I, I need to stress that. It shouldn't be the only one. Uh, it may lead to false uh, conclusions if I only see the kind of big power game and, you know, is Iran on our side or is it on the other side? Um, because then we, we miss out on all the details and all the difficulties uh, that arise uh, from a complex country such as Iran. I leave it at that and then I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. A number of really important points here. Uh, I, before I come back with a question to you, Cornelius, I once again like to encourage the audience. I mean, you all voted on whether or not the EU is doing enough. So I'm sure that you have some examples on your mind or some specific questions. If you were not there in the beginning when I mentioned it, please feel free to use the Q&A tool, put your questions or remarks there, and then we will be able to integrate them in our discussion on the panel. Um, Cornelius, you, you stress that it's not enough to have a unidirectional view or uh, um, uh, to see Iran exclusively through the uh, geostrategic, geopolitical lens. Obviously not. I think we also understood from both of you how connected both of them may be. But if you were to give specific recommendations, would you be able to mention a few points that you think that the European Union should respond to or that the European Union should put at the center of what it is formulating in terms of policy. I mean, I know you published this amazing paper. Thank you also for putting it in the chapter, Jean, um, advertising for this newly published paper of you, Cornelius, and Barbara Mittelhammer. But uh, for those who did not yet have a chance to read it, please share the key points. What do you think should Europe do at the moment? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, indeed, uh, the, the paper has just come out uh, with the Bell Foundation um, uh, and Barbara Mittelhammer, my, my partner in crime, uh, when it comes to working on uh, Iran and civil society at Carnegie Europe. Um, we have, in a way, tried to, to put together uh, some uh, guidelines, as we call it. Um, uh, it's a short paper, so you know, not too much time spent on reading it, but it's a substantial paper um, that uh, outlines uh, the elements which we see 
Um, and the, the one uh, takeaway um, I would like to say is that uh, the, the European Union uh, should look at human security in a, in a very uh, comprehensive way when, when uh, looking at Iran um, and not just state security, which is part of what uh, the, the paradigm has been uh, up until here, um, because there are so many uh, factors uh, flowing from this. Um, one element, and this goes back to, to what Giso had already mentioned, is the question, how does the European Union, which, you know, has no love lost for the Islamic Republic, um, how does it want to see change uh, coming uh, to that country? Um, change in a way that uh, also does justice uh, to the uh, to the um, the needs and the demands uh, of the, the Iranians um, in the country. Um, and that is something where uh, a focus needs to be placed on uh, working with civil society, supporting civil society inside the country, um, and uh, working uh, with uh, people that um, are um, uh, in, in Iran um, and that uh, have been, you know, still holding out despite all the, the repression, um, and that uh, would ideally would work uh, inside a, a structural framework that the European Union uh, establishes, uh, because it, Iran is not the only country um, which uh, provides a repressive context um, uh, or some some uh, backsliding, uh, but it is a, an instrument and it's something we highlight uh, at various uh, instances. It's an instrument uh, where the European Union needs to work with a number of countries in this particular situation, not just Iran, but also certainly in the region. Um, and so in that sense, uh, the, the focus on, on civil society and how can change come from within the country uh, is something that we would definitely highlight. Well, that was a very compact uh, analysis of what you already presented in a slightly broader version in the paper. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, actually, Gisto, I would love to come back to one issue that you mentioned, uh, civil society as an important actor, because European Union activities and support uh, always like to reach out to civil society actors. And therefore, I'd like to ask you, how do you see the possibilities? How could the European Union effectively support Iranian civil society actors and activists and their spaces? Um, are there chances to do so in Iran itself or mainly in the diaspora? Please share with us what you think, where could we do more? Yeah, could talk about some specific things and then also maybe zoom out to understand why the approach towards Iran might need to differ versus the approach that the EU has to other, country, other countries. So as Cornelius noted, there unfortunately is no shortage of repressive states across the world, right? Authoritarian regimes where the freedoms of um, people in the country are restricted. The way that the Islamic Republic is an outlier though, and in the company of countries like Afghanistan with the resurgence and, and return of the Taliban um, being the de facto power there is the extreme discriminatory framework against women. That gender discrimination truly makes it an outlier. And I think it's very important to note that because unfortunately we see around the world that ethnic and religious minorities are often discriminated against in different states. That's not a problem that is only uh, unique to Iran. Same thing for LGBTQI rights. Unfortunately, that is something that we see in many different countries where Iran is quite different is in this severe, extreme discriminatory framework. One of the legal efforts that I'm working on right now is the codification of the crime of gender apartheid. Apartheid currently only applies to race because of course the crime was constructed out of the experience of apartheid era South Africa, but we believe that the experience of the Taliban um, the experience of women living under the Taliban in Afghanistan and women living under the Islamic Republic in Iran are um, something that is parallel to that. And there are many South African jurists who agree with that, with us on that. And also Grasha Michelle, who is Nelson Mandela's widow and the former first lady of South Africa. Um, so the reason I mention that is because of just how extreme it is. And so for the EU and many European countries, 
that have feminist foreign policy and have women's rights sort of at the core of how they engage, I would love to see what the implementation of feminist foreign policy is. There's a lot of discussion of feminist foreign policy, but we don't see as much what is the implementation of that? So I think in terms of supporting civil society, this is just one thing that's critically important to understand of why Iran might be unique when assessing how do we deal with repressive states around the world and when the EU is making those calculations. So Cornelius noted that, for example, you know, uh, opening structural investigations into perpetrators of crimes against humanity who are responsible for you know, um, mass atrocities, that that might not be as easy of a decision because of some of the geopolitical considerations and the bilateral relationships between the states. But we're not dealing with, um, you know, we're dealing with a very extreme situation and it needs a robust accountability response because that are that is what people in Iran are asking for. That is what they're asking for. I think um, one thing where the EU could be specifically helpful in terms of strengthening civil society is um, to allow for humanitarian visas for many of the young leaders of the women life freedom protests, including those that were gravely injured. So many of those individuals are now in Germany, in Italy. Uh, many of the victims of blinding, for instance, are now in these countries seeking what is very complex medical treatment. And um, they were present at the UN Human Rights Council in March for the presentation of the FFMI's report and the interactive dialogue with the experts on the UN fact-finding mission on Iran. It was incredible to see these women and men who were attacked by Islamic Republic of Iran authorities and who were you know, intended to be left for dead, to be there and be the living proof of what the Islamic Republic did to this young generation and to really advocate for those rights and to speak for so many people who are unable to do that. But there's many, many more of these individuals who are stuck in Turkey, in Iraq, who have fled Iran because of the grave threat to them and who now cannot be resettled anywhere because of the slowness of the UNHCR um, bureaucracy, but also because of just, yeah, just restrictions, money-wise and others. Um, I deal with a lot of those individual cases. I'm just one person. It's a very ad hoc approach. We don't even have, you know, a very structured group um, apparatus to deal with this, but this is a this is an issue that government should be taking on and there should be more pathways for humanitarian visas when we have names of people who clearly can demonstrate that they were injured, that their story is valid, where there are witnesses that can corroborate their story, they should, there should be a pathway for them to come. We've seen that prior, prioritized with respect to different country contexts, obviously Ukraine, because it presented the situation there is really impacts Europe's security. I think there was like a different, um, a different robustness to how uh, frequently, you know, those paths were facilitated. But these individuals who, these Iranians who really made the ultimate sacrifice to simply let the Islamic Republic and the world know that they wish to just live a normal life where they can dress the way they please, like love who they please, listen to the music they please without this kind of government um, repression, they are they are living in limbo now because they made these sacrifices and they left Iran because of the security situation. I would like to see the facilitation of, of visas for them. Also, because I think the reality is that any opposition to the Islamic Republic is not only going to be created inside of the country because of the mass restrictions, because of all the brains and the talent that have left in recent years and indeed who have even left after 2022. Um, we see that some of the most prominent human rights lawyers that a decade ago I used to work with who were in the country and who were working within the system, most of them are in exile now. 
that brain drain and the people who are committed to human rights and democracy, we need to also be able to cultivate that on the outside. The reality is that this is gonna be a process that isn't only about the inside anymore. And because of the technological advancements and the fact that we are so connected to people inside the country, that is more of the, that is an appropriate way forward. So I'd like to see the facilitation of more humanitarian visas for these individuals who are really core in the fight. And then also an acceptance that some of the thinking about what should happen with civil society will also be flourishing on the outside because of all the human rights advocates and lawyers who have fled just in the past two years. Thank you, Isu. I actually, well, Cornelius, did you want to add something? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess that, um, you know, there's, it's always good to have a little bit of a debate on a panel. Um, and I, I simply, you know, I put it out there, I guess, um, we're, we're in, in big agreement on on the big things, um, the, the two speakers, Gisu and I. Uh, but I I have a little bit of a different view of uh, on the usefulness at this particular moment um, of bringing up uh, a new international um, uh, norm, um, as, as, as Gisu proposed, um, as opposed to using the instruments that we already have. Um, and that's, uh, that's twofold. Uh, the first one is that um, I would actually like to see governments um, pursue, as as you uh, you know uh, elaborated on, uh, universal jurisdiction, um, and and use uh, as as the the fact finding mission documented uh, the the proof of a crime against uh, humanity um, to uh, enhance uh, this kind of, kind of accountability. Um, uh, introducing um, a, a new norm, um, uh, gender apartheid, uh, on the basis of two countries, um, uh, Afghanistan and, and Iran, I fear is a distraction from the, the real, uh, really important work that is going on, especially if we don't know where this will lead and you know what additional instruments we would have if we're not even using uh, the instruments um, at the moment um, or uh, have a hard time pushing governments to use the, the instruments that are available. And my second point has to do with where we are in the world at the moment. Um, and I fear uh, that whoever is now in favor uh, of, uh, for example, gender apartheid as a new um, international norm, um, will have a hard time uh, explaining to the rest of the world uh, why these countries um, would set a new standard. We have difficulties uh, getting everyone around the UN table uh, agree on, um, uh, on condemning Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we have even more difficulties um, explaining, uh, and I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here, explaining whatever the European position on Israel's war on Gaza is, um, and the, the kind of um, fundamentals of uh, international law that are behind it. Um, so if, uh, say, the West, Western countries, uh, Western groups would now uh, propose a new international norm, um, I fear uh, we would not uh, achieve much. We would not help the people, uh, neither those uh, that have fled, nor the people who are still inside the country. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, you know, I just want to put in a different perspective uh, while agreeing on the, on the, on the principles of uh, strengthening um, international um, accountability uh, and using the instruments that are available, I would caution a little bit against uh, trying out something new where we don't know whether we can actually use it in, uh, in the near future. Yeah, you know, the fantastic thing is that fortunately we're not looking to um, Europe to lead the way on the codification of this crime. I just returned from a trip to Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia um, to discuss this. And of course, we have a cross-regional group of states that is supporting the inclusion of gender apartheid in the Crimes Against Humanity draft treaty that's currently being um, globally negotiated, that's going to be sent off for negotiations in October. Um, the Philippines came out in support, Brazil, Mexico, Chile. Um, so the good news is that also South Africa is on board. And of course, if we were worried about if a crime only applies to one country, then we would never have had the codification of genocide nor apartheid, since those were very specific to a country situation. Um, and we also saw that the crime of forced pregnancy came about because of the experience of Bosnia in the 1990s. So often it is a country situation that inspires the creation of a crime. And when survivor victims and survivors are asking for a legal gap to be recognized and to recognize their experience, 
um, that often animates that push. But fortunately, we have an incredible, robust cross-regional group of states that is supporting this. What I would urge European states to do is to not be left behind in that, out of a concern over cultural, cultural relativism, which is often raised, or um, a fear that we would be doing too much. I guess I'll point out the obvious, but we have the crimes of racial apartheid and race, racial persecution. Nobody is saying, oh, well, we are, you know, that that's too much. I've heard something like, well, there's gender persecution. So why are we going to have gender apartheid? I don't think anybody said that about race. And so it's really about recognizing how severe these situations are and having a crime codified that meets that moment. But fortunately, we have a time bound opportunity with the Crimes Against Humanity draft treaty. Um, as I noted, that will probably be sent off for negotiations in October by the sixth committee, the legal committee at the UN. And for anybody who's interested, I'm happy to give a bit more information about how you can have your governments more robustly support. We've had some great statements from European countries in support, but obviously our focus has been on the global majority. Um, and they were the countries that propelled the crime of apartheid for, forward, of course, because we saw incredible resistance from North America and, and many European countries to the codification of that crime. But I think we'll see a different trajectory here. Well, so interesting to hear you getting uh, involved in discussions about that. And it would deserve uh, an event on its own, I think. Uh, it's so interesting and really inspiring. And I think we could all learn a lot more about that. So please, everybody, follow Cornelius and Gisou on Twitter or any social media, because it, here you can see only like the, the tip of the iceberg of their excellent work. We are unfortunately already coming close to the end. We have 10 minutes left and two questions from the audience. And in the end, I'd also love to give two of you a very short question. So I will give you the two questions at the same time. Please be swift, please be to the point. One is referring to the um, to, to Iranian hostage taking. And it, the question is, to what extent does Iran use hostages to advance its goals? And what could the West do about this? The second question goes, more into the regional dimension, saying Iran has been labeled as part of an axis of upheaval together with China and Russia. Back in the day, the JCPOA was made possible together with China and Russia. And how could we make any progress on Iran in such, an, in such a new environment? So maybe Cornelius, if you would like to start with the second question. Uh, yes, why not? Um, thank you. And and thanks to um, the audience for, for engaging in this way. Um, it has indeed changed the international environment. And this is something that um, maybe the Europeans have been slow in, in understanding uh, that uh, this is no longer the world um, where uh, the, the nuclear deal or the, in which the nuclear deal came about. Um, and uh, for those who, who follow this particular file, you will know that uh, negotiations uh, have been stuck uh, since September uh, 2022, um, just before uh, the uprising started, but definitely since uh, since that uprising uh, has begun. Um, and so this is the, the moment where the Europeans are, in a way, um, back to basics, uh, and they have to uh, think about how, what is it that they want from Iran? What is the, what is the kind of interest that the Europeans bring uh, to the table? Um, and uh, let's respond uh, as, as they have in the past, let's respond to you know Iran's actions and try to to be more proactive uh, themselves, um, and that includes uh, taking a, a hard look. I would say, um, and Barbara and myself are saying in in, in our recent paper that takes uh, includes taking a hard look, for example, at sanctions and the use of sanctions um, as an instrument, um, uh, because many sanctions um, have in the past have been used um, more for symbolical reasons, um, which is a valid reason to to uh, issue sanctions, um, but at the same time, uh, one would have to take a look at the results um, of those sanctions. Um, and if, for example, as uh, as we said earlier, the European Union has a has a genuine interest in nurturing uh, whatever civil society uh, exists inside Iran, 
um, it would have to make sure that the sanctions that it imposes um, do not do damage um, to those uh, the, to the structures inside the country that are that are left there, um, and that, for example, could mean uh, to uh, include a, a civil society uh, conducted harm assessment into sanctions uh, legislation coming out of the European Union. Um, that's something that's an issue where there are um, experts working on this, uh, and and we've tried to. Uh, shepherd this process as much as we can, but uh, this is where where the European Union uh, needs to to look at its own instruments um, and its own approach uh, in a in a much uh, different way, um, because for whatever the the EU had been trying in the past, um, much of it was was around uh, the the nuclear file. It is still the, one of the the relevant uh, files, uh, especially with the with the advances that uh, Iran has been making ever since the United States left the deal. But it cannot also be uh, the only um, uh, focus of the Europeans. So in that sense, um, I would urge the Europeans to to ask themselves uh, about their own interests. Uh, what is it that they want from Iran? Uh, how do they want to uh, to the the regional developments? Uh, and, Going back to what uh, what is happening uh, next door in in Gaza um, and and the uh, Israeli war uh, there, um, because this is something where um, the Europeans uh, should not only look at Iran but have to take in the the regional security situation, the um, rapprochement that had taken place between Israel and Saudi Arabia up until uh, the attack by Hamas on, on October 7, um, and try to, to take this, this more regional approach uh, to Iran, uh, because that's uh, something that the Europeans can and should do regardless of uh, you know, the, the earlier arrangement with Russia and uh, China at the table. This is gone for the moment, uh, so the Europeans have to partner uh, with other countries, and that's most likely the, the countries in the region. Absolutely. And Gisu, um, what do you think uh, here? We have been talking about what the West could do, but here we have with the hostages an issue that Iran tends to use against its own citizens, against citizens of other countries, and part parts, partially also using against other countries to pressure them. How should we handle this? Would you have a quick answer to that? I think there's been <clears throat> a lot of extensive literature and thought thinking through how to best deal with the what is referred to as host hostage diplomacy. Um, there is no doubt that, of course, the Islamic Republic takes individuals arbitrarily, arrests them um, for purposes of political leverage. This was a pattern that um, I and others had noted since 2014, um, though at the time it was not described as hostage diplomacy. People were very loath to describe it that way, but that was what it was. And now I think that's been, become more of a mainstream way of referring to this because it's it's just very patently transactional. Um, of course, the Islamic Republic is not the only state who does this. We see that Russia does this, China does this. Venezuela, so the list is long. Um, I would say that in terms of looking at new ways to approach it, um, I'll of course bring the legal lens into it. There is a number of ways that it can be dealt with, but I think it might be worth looking at the pattern of that as crimes against humanity. So there is some uh, literature that has been written that looks very carefully at the elements of this and how this would be a systematic attack on part of a civilian population. I think bringing it out of, it's often referred to within, um, you know, more of a security framework, the offices that deal with it in government when they're created in the governments of the hostages who are taken when created um, don't really look at the connection to atrocity crimes. They're not really looking at the human rights violations that are occurring when this happens. And I think that can often politicize what we're looking at and create a narrative where there are many countries around the world who wouldn't sympathize with that. They would instead say, well, look at you know all the individuals who are being held for sanctions evasion in US jails who have Iranian nationality, right? So there'll be kind of like this equivalency that will arise. And I think it's really important to look at what are 
the core international crimes that are being committed when this happens and when it's done in such a systematic way that fits into a pattern and for what purposes. So that's part of the work I've been trying to do and that others have been trying to do to really reframe what we're discussing here because there are the livelihoods of people who are being taken away for nothing more than them having been a tourist or them having visited family. Um, and so the harms are, are quite egregious. Um, but also I would really caution a lot of people to take very seriously um, the prospect of traveling to Iran. For many years, I think it was very, you know, treated very dismissively. I can't go back to Iran anymore. I used to love going there. Obviously, it's a fantastic country and we're amazing hosts, as I'm sure anybody who's visited knows. But if you are holding a passport, um, an EU passport, a passport from a European country, you know, there is going to be that risk. And I think we need to be a, a take that risk a little more seriously and understand that it's not as our, you know, it's very arbitrary. And so, yeah, you could go and come back and all is fine, but you could also go and be randomly taken, even if you have no con connection to politics. And that really um, has other effects on the other side. We see that, um, there's now concerns that Hamid Nouri, who I mentioned, was um, the only universal jurisdiction case on Iran and was convicted for his role in connection to the killings of thousands of political prisoners in 1988 in Iran's prisons. Um, there's a prospect that he might be traded out for, you know, a Swedish um, nationals who've been taken hostage in the country. Um, so there's real pro there's real potential downsides for the governments that have to negotiate for these individuals to come out. And it has impacts on accountability measures and other um, advancements in other ways. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Gisou. We're at the end of the session, but as I said, well, in the end, I would love to have a last final word of each of you. Maybe it is a big challenge, but if each of you could just frame it in one sentence. If you had to pick from the variety of avenues you showed for uh, Europe to, to improve and expand its Iran policy and strategy, if you had to pick one single issue, just give us one last sentence, which one would that be? Cornelius, you already opened the microphone, so you're in the pole position. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I, I've tried to outline this in a little bit. Um, uh, it builds on uh, the, the way the European Union thinks about um, Iran. Um, it should, first of all, know what it wants, uh, shouldn't be pushed into knee-jerk reactions, uh, kind of piling on sanctions just because we don't like what Iran is doing, be a little bit more smarter um, and try to work with the region because Iran cannot be separated uh, from the region within it is. That was really great. Gisu, what would you pick as the most important issue of all the ones that you have on your list? Um, definitely the focus on feminist foreign policy and what that means and to not get caught into ideas of cultural relativism, which too often plague um, the movement for action and really understanding, as I emphasize, that Iran alongside Afghanistan and maybe less than a handful of other countries around the world are really outliers when it comes to enshrining extreme discrimination against women in the laws. Um, the implementation is a different topic that we can get into, but those are there as a matter of law. So what does that mean in terms of engaging with such a country and um, really thinking through the accountability measures as a result and how we're going to focus on that. So I think woman life freedom brought, th brought that more under the microscope, things that people have been saying for decades, it became much more clear, but we shouldn't lose the perspective on the fact that they truly are an outlier in this very important way. And if we wanna speak about feminist foreign policy, then that cannot be dismissed. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. Um, we should know what we want. We should be smarter. We should focus on feminist foreign policy and focus on avenues to accountability as well as supporting civil society. Uh, some of the core findings that I take from today's session 
Thank you so much, Cornelius and Gisu, for taking the time, for being with us and sharing your expertise. Thank you also to Roderick, uh, Louise, uh, Jean and Paul and everybody from the Brussels team who made this possible. And I hope we will have another chance to discuss with you and with others what Europe should improve in its strategy regarding Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you.